series, I don't know how far we'll go with it. One thing depends on how God leads with Kevin and all that. Uh, but we started talking about these minor prophets. Uh, we call them minor prophets. Basically, the reason they call them minor prophets is because they're short books. Okay, but they are not unimportant books. We talked the first one uh, that we talked about was Hosea. Uh, a powerful message in Hosea. How God just simply wants us to love Him the way He loves us. I mean, that's basically Hosea's message that God loves mankind. He, we are His creation. He loves us. All He wants is for us to love Him the way He loves us. And then we talked about Joel uh, two weeks ago. Joel's message was simply, uh, if you will, the coming of Christ. You know, it's the day of the Lord. Uh, and it's a really a very powerful message. Uh, a message that we all really need to understand. Uh, the day of the Lord, we're going to just touch on that for a minute here today, but the day of the Lord is not a day, it's a period of time. We know, uh, with the, now in the Old Testament, well I'm going to say that because I'm uh, getting ahead of myself, I'm going to repeat it later, but the day of the Lord is a seven year period of time which begins at the rapture, starts the tribulation, ends with Christ coming to the earth to rule for a thousand years, okay? So his message was very important. Joel, the message of Joel was a critically, really important message for the church. Even. We say it's Old Testament. I don't mean it. You need to know the Old Testament. The Old Testament is God's word. Today we're going to talk about Amos. Amos is another one of those books. We call them the minor prophets. We think, to be honest, most people probably have never even read it. It's one of those books of the Bible that gets neglected because it's a short book kind of stuck uh, in there and it just gets neglected. But the message you're going to hear today is a very powerful message. Now, I don't even think that I can begin to do the message justice. I'm going to do the best I can. But uh, the message that you're going to hear today, the message of Amos is a critically uh, important message. Okay, and I'm going to do the best I can to give it to you as briefly as I can. I'm not picking out verses per se. I want to give you a total um, thing on the whole book of Amos, okay? So we're not going to really focus in on just one or two verses uh, topically. We're going to actually try to understand what the whole book of Amos is, what he's trying to convey. The most uh, well-known verse probably in Amos is Amos 3.3. Uh, if you don't know any of them, if you've been in church much at all, most Christians have heard this verse. Uh, can two walk together unless they agree? I think most people, if you spend any time in church, you've heard that uh, at some point. That comes from Amos 3.3. Now, that is true for people. Can two people walk together if they don't agree? No. You might walk a little ways, but you're not going to walk long. If you're not in agreement, uh, they can, you know, you're to... But listen, the bigger thing, and really what he's trying to say there, two people can't walk together unless they agree. But listen, you can't walk with God either unless you agree. Yes. Now, the sad thing, well, I don't say sad, that's probably right. God's not going to change. So who has to change? We do. We do. Listen, can two walk together unless they agree? No. And we cannot walk with God. God is not going to change to suit us. Simply put, we have to change to walk with God. And that really is the message of God. Uh, Amos. So let's start. We're not going to focus in. I'm not going to read an opening verse. That's usually how you do. You know, you've got a little section you read. We're just going to try to do the overall book of Amos, okay, uh, today. So let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Father, again, we thank you for the privilege that we have today to be here. We thank you for the Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you so much for Calvary, for that shed blood uh, that he shed there upon the cross. Father, we thank you for salvation by grace that is through his work, his finished work, not through our works or through our merit. Father, we just thank you again for the great love that you love us with. We pray now as we look at this uh, book of Amos. Father, I pray that you'd help me to present it in a way that's clear and understandable. Father, help me to present it in a way that each one here can walk out of here really understanding what you're trying to say to us. Father, we pray again that if there's even one here today that's lost, I pray that your Holy Spirit today would draw them into yourself, that they too would come to know our Savior. Pray the body of Christ will be edified, built up in the holy faith, encouraged by the things that we hear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Amos was written about 800 to 700 B.C. So that puts him just shy of 3,000 years. So it, it's an old book. It goes back a long time. But Amos was written 
uh, in the period of time, the contemporaries, other prophets uh, of Amos were Jonah. He lived at the same time that Jonah lived. Hosea, that we talked about a couple weeks ago. Isaiah and Micah. So these prophets, all their lives kind of overlap. Okay, so he's about 750, say roughly, years before Christ. He lives in this same time period with uh, Jonah, Hosea, Isaiah, and Micah. Uh, he lived in Tekoa. Tekoa is a kind of a mountainous region about 11 miles south of Jerusalem. He's a shepherd slash farmer. He shepherds his sheep and he gathers figs to sell. So he's a shepherd, farmer in the southern part of Judea. All right? And he is called by God to go to Bethel, which is in the northern kingdom. Okay? Just real quick. Uh, Israel, after Solomon, his son, Israel, after Israel got so wicked or whatever, so bad. Anyway, under Solomon, God after him divided the kingdom. You have the southern kingdom now of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. Okay? So Amos lives in the southern kingdom. But God is going to send him to the northern kingdom to prophesy. Okay? He's going to go to Bethel. Real quick, when Jeroboam became king, the first king, he knew that his kingdom would leave him to return to the temple that was in the southern kingdom. To keep that from happening, he built two temples, made golden calves, put one in Dan, and put one in Bethel. Alright, so this is where Amos is going. He's going to Bethel to where Jeroboam set up this idolatrous religion. Okay? He's going to the state church, if you will. It's idolatrous worship, but in its day, this is Bethel, it's a city. He's a country boy being sent to the city. And he's being sent to Bethel, which is where the temple is of the state church. It's important to understand that. Uh, this isn't an independent Bible-believing temple that he's going to, okay? He's going to the temple where Jeroboam has set up an idolatrous religion, all right? So that's it. Uh, the theme, the theme of Amos is justice. He references God seven times, <coughs> excuse me, as Lord of Lords, or Lord of God of Hosts, I'm sorry, Seven times he calls him Lord God of hosts. What does that mean? Listen, are the names of, of God in the Bible important? Of course they are. Listen, it's through the names of the Bible that we really learn about God's character and who he is and all of that. So this Lord God of hosts, what does that mean? It simply means this, warrior God. We don't typically think of God like that, do we? When was the last time you thought of God as a warrior God? But that's exactly what Amos is presenting here in his book. That God is a warrior God. Okay? Now, the next thing, let's just look at a couple of these where he mentions that. Uh, look, if you will, if you turn to Amos, chapter 3, verse 3. Or 13. Chapter 3, verse 13. It says, Hear ye and testify in the house of Jacob, saith the Lord God, the God of hosts. Chapter 4, verse 13. He says this, For lo, he that formed the mountains and created the wind and declared unto man what is his thought, that maketh the morning darkness and treadeth upon the high places of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. Chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. He says this, Seek good and not evil that ye may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as ye have spoken. Hate the evil, love the good, establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Verse 16, Therefore the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord saith thus, Wailing shall be in all the streets, and they shall say in all the highways, 
Alas, alas, and they shall call the husbandmen to mourning and such as are skillful to lamentation to well in chapter 5, verse 27. It says this, Therefore will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Chapter 6, verse 8. It says, The Lord God hath sworn by himself, saith the Lord, the God of hosts, I abhor the excellency of Jacob, I hate his palaces, therefore will I deliver up the city with all that are therein. Okay, uh, verse 14, chapter 6. But behold, I will raise up against a nation, O house of Israel, saith the Lord, the God of hosts. Chapter 9, verse 5 says this, the Lord God of hosts is he that touches the land. So what we see here is just every, almost every chapter of Amos, it's over, over, over again, he's saying the Lord God of hosts. Why is he doing that? Because he's driving home a point. We need to know who God is. Amen. And sad thing even for the church today, too many of us don't. We do not recognize who God truly is. And that's what he's saying to these people. They need to know God is a warrior God. And he drives that point home. We just read all of these verses where over and over and over again he's telling them what? The Lord God of hosts. Driving home that point. Now, if you will, turn to chapter 4, verse 12. We're going to get, what was Amos' message? Amos' message we see in chapter 4, verse 12, says this, Thus, or therefore, Thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this thing unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Now, that's a powerful verse. When do you meet your God? <coughs> when do you meet your God? When you what? Die. Die. What he's simply saying then, prepare to die. Yes. It's a powerful message that Amos has been sent to deliver to these nations. It's a very serious message. His message is simply this, that they need to get ready to die. All right. So what we want to look at is this. Amos is announcing the coming judgment on Syria, Gaza, which is the Philistines, all right, the Phoenicians, Edom, Ammon, Moab, Judah, and Israel. So what we have is simply this. We have the northern country, if you will, of Israel now, because it's divided, the southern kingdom of Judah. It used to be one country, all Israel, now it's two you have a southern kingdom and a northern kingdom. So what we have now is all of these countries that he names border around Israel. And God is just fed up with all of them. Mm. Can God get fed up? Yes. Did he destroy the ancient world in the days of Noah? Yes. Can the world go so far that God says, I've had it? Yes. yes. And that's exactly where they are at right now. These countries, Israel in the center, and all these countries around them, God just looks at them and he says, What? Well, I'm fed up with all of them. I've had it with all of them. Alright? And he now is going to pronounce judgment on these countries. Alright? So he begins, if you will, turn back to chapter 1. In chapter 1, verse 3, he says this. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four. Look at verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four. Verse 9. For thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyrus and for four. What is he doing here? He's not saying, I have three or four things against you. Now, you can read that and kind of perceive that, but that's not what he's saying. What he's, he's kind of in a sense of a little bit of maybe sarcastic or whatever. He said, look, God's had it with all of you. He's just saying here, I have three or four things transgressing. But he can, uh, I've got a lot of things. Your cup of iniquity is full. God's had it with all of you. Okay, is really what he's saying here. 
Okay, he says three transgressions or four, but he just means, listen, you're so sinful, you're so wicked, you're so everything ungodly that God has just, he's fed up with all of it. Okay? Now, that said, uh, when he says that, he singles out one thing, though. In verse 3 with Syria, he will say three transgressions, four, but then he will single out one thing. He'll do that with all six of these bordering countries. I think it's interesting what, what Amos does was pretty smart. Now, I no doubt God led him uh, probably to do that. But what he did was simply this. He didn't start with Israel or Judah. He starts with the countries around them. Because his message is what? Judgment. That God is going to judge all of them. That, that's his message. And he doesn't start with it. Had he started with Israel, would they have listened to the rest of it? No. So actually he leaves Israel where he's preaching to Bethel. He leaves them for what? Last. Okay? Now, he begins with Syria. And just to make it quick, we're not going to read it. We won't get through all of this too much. Uh, hopefully you'll take my word for it. You can go back and read it for yourself if you want to. And Verse 3, he begins with Syria. And really what he addresses Syria, God's got a lot of things against them. They're a wicked people. I mean, he could just go through and leave them, but he doesn't do it. He lists the one thing is this. They are a cruel and heartless people. Listen, God hates cruel and heartless people. Yes. And that's what he says to Syria. Though they have many things that God's against, his big problem with Syria is that they're a cruel and a heartless people. All right, he goes on to the next one. It says here Gaza, but for us to maybe understand a little bit better, this is the land of the Philistines. Okay, these are the Philistine people. Most of you, if you watch much news at all, we know what's going on in Israel. That same Gaza that they're fighting right now, that's, that's exactly where we're talking about, that land area. Okay? So you understand where this is at. And at that time, they were the Philistines. Today, we call them the Palestinians. But they were Philistines back at this time. Okay? Now, against Gaza, or the Philistines, he's angry with them for taking slaves. Now, it's common practice in this time and in this day. When you would go to war... You would defeat your enemies, and when the battle was over, you would spoil or take any wealth that you could find from your enemies, and you would capture people and make them slaves. That's just how it was done. That's not what he's talking about here. What the Philistines were doing was simply this. They hate Jews. And we see that today. Do the Palestinians hate Jews? Yes. Of course they do. They hate Jews even to this day. So we can understand the mindset. But when they saw a person and they're like, oh, he's a Jew. Didn't matter if he was from Judah or from Israel. A Jew's a Jew. Whenever they would see a Jew and they could, they would capture them. Only for one intent. Was to sell them. Because they what? They hate them. Mm -hmm. They just hate them. That's the only reason they're doing it. It wasn't war. Capturing your enemy at the end of a battle, at the end of a war, that was normal practice. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about when they see a Jew, they hate Jews, they capture him and sell him into slavery. But in Genesis 12, 1, uh, or 12, 8, I'm sorry, 12, 3, all right, we read this. God made a promise to Abraham, and we all know the promise. And I will bless those who bless thee, and I will curse those who curse thee. Are they blessing or cursing Israel? They're cursing Israel. Yes. Now, if they curse Israel, what's God going to do to them? He's going to curse them back. Okay? So that's basically what we have in this situation. So then we go to Phoenicia. The next one is Phoenicia. God's problem with Phoenicia is this. The Palestinians capture the Jews. They sell them as slaves, but they're selling them to Phoenicia who then sells them throughout the Mediterranean world. And God hates that. They are what? Dispersing the Jews. Did God call them to their homeland? Did God establish it? Yes. And they are doing the exact opposite, if you will. But the biggest problem was this. 
they had a treaty with Israel. God had established a treaty between Phoenicia and Israel, and now they have broken the treaty or the covenant with Israel, and they are now selling Jews around the area, which God hates, dispersing his people all around the area. But the biggest problem was this. Does God expect us to keep our word? Yes. Yes. They had a covenant with Israel. Israel did not break the covenant. Phoenicia broke the covenant. And God will not excuse that. Okay? He didn't like what they were doing, but he really didn't like the fact that they had a covenant and they did not keep it. Okay, so then we go to Edom in verse 11. Edom's problem is simply this. They are a merciless, vengeful people. You ever heard the phrase, it's Bible, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? That's Bible, isn't it? But listen, Edomites are two eyes for an eye, two teeth for a tooth. Yes. It isn't justice, it is. Listen, you do me and I'll get you back to twofold over. That, do you know anybody like that? At least some of us, I know some people that you get them, <coughs> count on them, they're going to get you back. Mm. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, but I will repay. Listen, Christians need to leave it to the Lord. But these people are vengeful, mercilessly vengeful. Okay? Ammon. The problem he had with Ammon was brutal. They're just a brutal people. Typically throughout history, when you went to war, you did not kill women and children. Soldiers fight soldiers and that type of thing. Uh, now that's always been exceptions to everything and different rules and all that. But typically you don't kill women and children. Okay? But the Ammonites are brutal. They kill women and children and apparently they love, it was like a, some kind of prize to kill a, woman, a pregnant woman. It was like some kind of, they could hold up, I killed a pregnant woman, you know. Kind of, but they're brutal. They're just a brutal people. They kill women, they kill children, and especially God was angry because they targeted, if you will, pregnant women. So the next one was Moab. The same thing really is Am. Uh, Am. They're just a vengeful people. They are a people. Moab is just a people who carry this vengeance to the nth degree. They don't just get you back. They're going to get you and get you and get you, that kind of thing. They're really the same kind of spirit as Edom. Okay, so then he came to Judah, the southern kingdom, and he's preaching against Judah. And when he gets to Judah, he says simply this, God's problem with them was for not keeping his commandments, for despising his law. But who did God, listen, God brought them out of Egypt. He established them in this land. Gave them cities, houses that they did not build. Put them in a land flowing with milk and honey. Had God been good to him, Judah? Yes. And despite God's goodness to them, they won't keep his law. They despise his commandments. To whom much is given, much is required. Mm -hmm. Had Judah been given much? Definitely. And because they had been given much, God is going to require much from them. So, up until this point, now you've got a picture, and that's what we said earlier. Where is Amos at? He's a southern Judah country boy that was called to go north and preach where? In Bethel at the king's chapel. Now, is this message resonating in Bethel? They love him. These are Israel's enemies. All these countries around. When Amos shows up and he's preaching against Syria and against the Philistines and the Phoenicians and the Edom and Moab and all of them, they love it. He's preaching hard judgment is coming on all of these countries. They're their enemies. Do they love him? Of course they love him. Uh, probably if they were like us, we're not a big amen in uh, church and all that. But listen, when Amos showed up and starts preaching church, everybody's saying what? 
Amen. Amen. They love this message. He's preaching judgment on who? Their enemies. They love it. But then if you look at uh, verse 2, uh, I'm sorry, verse chapter 2, verse 6, he says this. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel as before, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they sold the uh, righteous for silver, and the poor, and anyway, he goes on and on and on. But who's he talking to now? Israel. Now listen, it's good preaching when you're talking to the guy beside me and his problems and his sins and his everything. But when you start stepping on my toes, you're going to what? Too far. You're meddling. Well, you went too far because you started meddling. You're meddling now. Amos was great. They loved Amos mm -hmm. until he started pronouncing judgment on Israel. Yes. Now, just to give us a quick heads up, uh, turn, if you will, to chapter 7, verse 10. In chapter 7, verse 10, Amaziah, the chief, if you will, priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, go, flee, uh, flee thee away into the land of Judah. And there eat bread and prophesy there. But prophesy not again any more at Bethel. For it is the king's chapel and it is the king's court. What is he simply saying there is this. <coughs> Get out of town. You cannot come to Bethel and preach that kind of message. We won't have it. He went to the king to have Amos removed. Did he? Excuse me. When he went to Amos to have the king removed, he lied. Amos never said that Jehoshaphat was going to be killed by the sword. He never said that. But look, if you're going to go lie, you might as well. It's your lie. You tell it your lie, right? So if it helps your cause, anyway, they run Amos out of town because they don't like the message. Now listen, does that happen to the church? Yes. Yeah, it does. Preacher's preaching, he's saying something, and listen, as long as he's stepping on everybody else's toes, that's okay. Amen, right? Yeah. But when he starts stepping on my toes, when he starts hurting, hitting me, then it's like, how dare he? Now the question that I said, I should say is, is it what? True. Yes. You know, one of the things I always do with the kids when they come to me, they're like, oh, and so said whatever, you know, and because uh, that's kids, that's what they do, you know, and I'll be like, is it true? And every once in a while, I'm like, yeah, well, then you need to deal with it. If it's true, deal with it, right? But listen, if it's not true, well, then don't worry about it. It's not true. But listen, Amos was speaking truth. And to just get mad because you don't like it isn't going to help yourself any good. Okay? They got mad. When Amos started preaching against Israel, now they're mad. And now they're going to run him out of town. Because they're not going to hear it. What does he pronounce against Israel? The big thing you're going to see when he started talking to Israel, and most of the book from here out will deal more specifically with Israel than it will with all these other countries. But the judgment that is coming, I'll just give you a little heads up real quick. Uh, the Assyrians are going to come in. Followed by them will be the Babylonians. But it came out of the Okay? God is going to bring judgment, not just on them, okay? It's not just a, a country nation. Babylon will conquer the known world mm -hmm. in its day, okay? But specifically, Amos is preaching, letting them know God's hand of judgment is coming. And it's going to be brutal. The Assyrians, when they came in, were brutal. Babylon, under King Nebuchadnezzar, the Chaldeans, they came in and they crushed. They defeated the world in their day, the first world empire. All right, so he begins now to mention their sins. He says that they had the Mosaic Law, and they had not kept it. They had not kept God's commandments, just like Judah 
God's blessed him. They were God's chosen people. He brought them out of Egypt. He established them in the land. He did all of these things. He'd been so good to them. And yet, despite all of his goodness to them, they rejected him. Alright? So that said, he then goes on. He didn't do this with any of the other countries, but with Israel, he does this. And you'll see through Amos a lot. He is, comes up a lot of times. I didn't count them because I just didn't think to. But, and it takes time to count them, I guess. But over and over and over through and Amos, he is talking about how they treat the poor. Listen, God hates it when you oppress the poor. Yes. And we as Christians need to understand. Listen, we need to be good to poor people. We need to treat poor people good. And over and over through Amos, he, he is talking about how they treat and oppress the poor. But he also talks about illicit sex, immorality that's rampant throughout the land. Sounds like America. You can't even watch TV anymore. The commercials are so filthy, you can't even watch a good show on TV because of the, of the commercials. Yes. But listen, it's not just fornication and adultery. And I'm just going to say illicit sex. And I don't want to carry your mind too far because we don't need to put garbage in our brains. But there, it's just illicit sex and immorality has filled the land. And Amos speaks against that. He also speaks out uh, against idolatry. Now, idolatry, that's funny because he's in Bethel where Jeroboam set up what? An idolatrous He's in an idolatrous temple preaching this message. Okay? So he preaches against idolatry, drunkenness, gluttony. That's what we don't hear a whole lot about today. We don't talk too much about gluttony. Probably because too many of us like to eat. We kind of leave that for blood. I don't know. You know, I kind of like to go to a buffet myself. But when I go to a buffet, I tend to what? You can't eat too much. You know? But anyway, it is a sin. Let's just face it. You know, gluttony is a sin. Okay, So he preaches against gluttony. And this one I think kind of took me by surprise. But ungodly music. Has America got some ungodly music? Yes. America has got some filthy, ungodly music. They did in their day too. And Amos points that out to them that got sick of their music. Now, when Amos begins to preach like this, do they love him anymore? <laughs> no. They're, now they're going to the king and they're like, get him out of town. <laughs> they do not want him around. They loved it when he's preaching on everybody else, but now he's stepping on their toes so they want to run him out of town. Now, does that happen in the church? Of course it does. People get mad. They don't like the message. Something happens. Another preacher, whatever. Well, I'll just take my toys and go home. You know, I can find another church. I don't have to put up with this. Whatever. Listen, if it's true, I need to deal with it. Amen. Don't get yes. mad at the preacher if he's preaching and what he's saying is true. That means I need to deal with something in my life. Now, if it's not true, that's a whole different thing. And if it's not true, you should be able to go to the pastor and say, look, I can show you what you said isn't true. And if you can do that, do that because you should. And he should apologize, and I think a godly man will. If he sees that, hey, watch that, he'll apologize. If he, but you should be able to show him how he's wrong. But don't get mad if it's true. If it's true, I don't need to get mad. I need to what? I need to deal with it in my life. Yes. Okay, so that's it. Uh, his message again was prepared to meet thy God. What he's simply saying is this. Severe judgment is coming on them because of their sin and their ungodliness. Now, I want to give you an idea just how severe he's preaching this message. Turn, if you will, uh, to uh, chapter 3, verse 12. In chapter 3, verse 12, we have this. <coughs> Excuse me. He's talking here in these verses about the judgment that's coming. Okay? And in verse 12, he says this. For thus saith the Lord... As the shepherd taketh out of the mouth of the lion two legs and a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out that dwell in Samaria in the corner of a bed and Damascus in a couch. Now, he's saying just this judgment that's coming is going to be like a lion that attacks a flock and gets a sheep. 
and the shepherd might save or kill the lion and then take what? Take out two legs. Are the sheep just devastated? What he's saying here is this. Listen, you're not going to pull the live sheep, lamb, out of the lion's mouth. This thing is going to be two legs and an ear. In fact, a piece of an ear. That's how severe this judgment that's coming is. Look, if you will, at chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. In verses 16 and 17 of chapter 5, he says, Therefore the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord, saith thus, Wailing shall be in all the streets, and they shall say in all the highways, Alas, alas, and they shall call the husband uh, to mourning, and such as are skillful of lamentation to wailing. And in all the build vineyards uh, shall be wailing, for I will press through the land, or pass through the land, uh, saith the Lord. So, chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. And it shall come to pass if, if there remain ten men in one house, that they shall what? Die. die. That's if you can even find ten men in the house, they're going to die. If a man's uncle shall take him up, and he that burneth him uh, to bring him out, to bring out the bones out of the house and shall say unto him uh, that is by the sides of the house. Now the reason that he simply says that is simply this. What he's saying here is this. There's going to be so many dead bodies we can't bury. Mm. That's what he's saying. We're just going to have to pile them up and burn them. Mm. Because there's going to be so many dead bodies we can't bury them. Now then, uh, shall he say, hold thy tongue for we may not make mention of the name of the Lord. Look at the next uh, one is in chapter 7, verses 8 and 9. Verse 8 says, And the Lord saith unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A plumb line. Then he said unto me, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not again pass by them any more. And the red places of Isaac, and the high places, I'm sorry, of Isaac, of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and it will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. What he's simply saying here is this. Now, we have these things. We've got presidents. We've had a, a, there's a red line. You ever heard that one? We've heard this red line. Okay. What does a red line mean? You cross that line, and our, in our world and in our government, it don't mean a thing. Does it? It don't mean a thing. Well, depending on who the president is, but right now, it don't mean a thing. <laughs> Okay? Now, God says, he says plumb line, but what he means here, take a tape measure, he drew a line, and he tells Amos, look, you take the tape measure and you measure. So what he did was, when Amos pulled the tape, and then, did it cross the line? Yes. They had went too far. Amos is saying, listen, you've been ready. You cross the line. God means it when he draws red lines. Yes. God isn't playing. The sooner we figure that out, the better we'll all be. Yes. God's not playing. When God says there's a red line, there's a line in the sand, he means there's what? There's a line. And when you cross that line, then he's going to do what he's going to do. And he's telling them what he's going to do. They have what? They have went too far. But the sad thing here is this. He says here in this that I will no more let me look at it. Um, I think the saddest verse here is in chapter 9. Look at, well, let's just read the whole word. And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. I'm sorry, it was verse 8. All right, but back up to verse 8. And he says, I will send a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not again pass by them. To me, that's, of all the judgments that we've read, mm -hmm. this is the saddest. Because you know what it means? God is simply saying this. I'm done with you. Do you ever hear from God, I'm done with you? I think that's the worst thing of all the judgments, as bad as they all are, and they are all bad, but when he says here, I'm done with you, that's the worst of all these judgments. Look at the next one, uh, chapter 8, verses 2 and 3. He says this, and he said, uh, Amos, 
What seest thou? And I said, The basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, The end of all uh, is, the end is come upon my people Israel, and I will go again. I will not again pass by them anymore. Basically saying what the same thing he's done with. Okay, verse 3. And the songs of the temple shall be howling in that day, saith the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies in every place, and they shall pass them forth with silence. Now, I think you get a little bit of the idea why they don't like Amos. This is how Amos comes to Bethel. At first, he's preaching against everybody else, and they love him, and he's great. You know, but when he starts preaching against Israel, and listen, is there coming a, if you will, horrific judgment upon them? Yes. yes. And he's simply there to declare to them, it's coming. Listen, God never judges that he doesn't what? Warn. We talked about that in Job. God doesn't, did he warn the people before the flood? Yes. yes. Noah spent 100, what was it, 120 years, 100 years, building a boat and preaching, warning the people what was coming. But listen, God always warns before He judges. Yes. And that's what He's doing here. He's warning them. And listen, is He telling them just how bad it's going to be? Mm -hmm. Yes. And is it going to be bad? Yes. Yes. And is He hiding that from them? Yes. No. He's telling them exactly how bad it's going to be. And he's letting them know it is coming. So is God good in that sense that he warns them? He lets them know. He's telling them. All right, so that's it. Now, turn, if you will, to chapter 5, verse 18. I have an interesting little verse here in verse 18. He says this. I don't know what time it is. I'm not even going to worry about the time. If I go too late, I apologize. I'm just going to finish the message, okay? Uh, verse 18, he says this, Woe unto you the desire of the day of the Lord. To what end is that for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Now, obviously, Joel, we talked back uh, two weeks ago, Joel was the prophet who introduced to Scripture the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is not a day. It is a what? Period of time. It's seven years. We know today, because we have the benefit of the New Testament and further teaching, but in their day, we know the day of the Lord begins with the rapture of the church. When the church is raptured out, the tribulation period begins, and that Christ then comes on the scene. You, know, you have his kingdom, all that God then, and Revelation chapter 6 and 7 pours out his wrath on the earth, his anger that he has accumulated. All of that happens during these at the end of the tribulation was the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Okay, the Messiah for Israel, Savior for us. But he returns, sits on the throne of David, rules the earth for a thousand years. Okay, they don't know that. Okay, the church age is a mystery in the Old Testament. They think, and this was a problem for a lot of people in Jesus' day. They thought when Messiah come or came that he would what? ascend to the throne of David and rule. Mm -hmm. They were not looking for a church age, an age of grace. They weren't looking for any of that. In their minds, that was a mystery. They, the Old Testament said nothing about that. Okay? So when they think of the day of the Lord, they simply think what? Christ the Messiah will come sit on the throne of David, restore Israel to all of its glory, and We'll escape all this. That's what they're saying. And I think Patty just answered your question. Amos says what? No. No. <laughs> no. That's not going to happen. For one thing, if that happened, how does the day of the Lord begin? In darkness, meaning what? Judgment. It begins in judgment. And it's not going to be a good time. So he's saying, listen, even if what you're saying, if the Lord came back, delivered you, and none of this is going to happen because Christ the Messiah comes, we can be spared. The day of the Lord still begins with what? Judgment. So that's a foolish way to think. Anyway, but you know, some of us as Christians, we kind of 
You ever had something bad coming up and you really don't want to have to deal with it or whatever? Boy, I wish the Lord would come back. Right? You know, boy, I just wish the Lord would come back and I could get out of this. I wouldn't have to do it. Wouldn't have to go here. Wouldn't have to. You know, and the other thing happens, you know, maybe we're going to have a baby or we're going to get married, you know, whatever. No, I hope the Lord don't come back this week. Right? Listen, that is a sad mentality about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is not about me. It's about Him. And listen, having a baby is a great thing. But it will not top the Lord Jesus Christ's return. Yes. And we need to understand that. And it isn't to get me out of something down here. That's not why we're... It's wanting the Lord to come back to get me out of something. No, I want the Lord to come for His glory, for His glory. So we need to have a right attitude about the day of the Lord ourselves. But that's what they're doing. They're thinking, we're going to get out of this thing. God will deliver us and all that. Now, look if you will. I think this is just a really neat verse in verse 19. He says this, As if man did flee from a lion and a bear at him. And he went uh, into the house, and he leaned his hand on the wall, and the what, serpent bit him. What he's simply saying there is this, and this follows the last verse that we just talked about. Listen, God always was before he judges. Yes. Okay? So he's telling these people, listen, you've been warned by God. Think of it like this, as a bear or as a lion. You're warned. So you're walking down the path, you see a lion, and that's a the road you're on is the broad road. You know, it's an ungodly road. It's taking you to destruction. So God sends a line. You know, and at first you do whatever you run. You do. So you get away from the line and you're like, well, things get a little better. Life starts leveling out, you know. So what do you do? Just return to the same way you walk, the same way you talk, the same, you know, you're same old life time, you know. That. So you get a little further down the trail and what? You see a bear. No, no, a bear, you know. So, same thing. You kind of run, you get away from the bear, and you're like, Phew. Yeah. But listen, these are warning signs, is what he's saying. God sends warnings. So, you get home. Home is a place of what? Security, right? Safety at home. You're home, you made it. The lion didn't get you, the bear didn't get you, now you're home. And because you're home, you feel what? Safe, secure. And back in these times, and we still have houses today that have walls or fences or whatever around it. Uh, so he gets to his house and probably runs from the line. He ran from the bear and he gets to his house and he's tired, you know, and he, he puts his hand up on the wall of the house and what? Snake bites. Listen, you might escape the line, you might escape the bear, but God's justice will catch up with us. Yes. We're only fooling ourselves when we think it won. Okay? So that said, God is always, or I'm sorry, God always gives hope. Turn to chapter 5, if you will. In chapter 5, verse 4, he says this, For thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, Seek me, and what? And ye shall live. Verse 6. Seek the Lord, and ye shall what? Live. Lest he break out like a fire in the house of Joseph and devour it, and there be none to quench it in Bethlehem. Seek the Lord, that ye shall live. Verse 8. He says, Seek him that maketh the seven stars and Orion. In other words, the heaven. And turneth the shadow of death into the morning, and maketh the day dark with night. That calleth for the waters of the sea that poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is His name. All right. So look at verse 14 through 15. He says, "Seek good and not evil, that ye may live." And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as ye have spoken. Hate the evil, love the good, establish judgment in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious unto the remnant of Joseph. Listen, in chapter 5, does he give them hope? Mm -hmm. Now listen, this hasn't been a hopeful message, has it? No. 
I mean, if you understand about even relatively coming folks at all, he is preaching a coming judgment that is so horrible that they can't stand to hear it. In fact, they're going to run him out of town for it. They're not going to have it. But does he give them hope? Of course he does. In chapter 5, he gently tells them what? Seek the Lord and what? Live. This judgment doesn't necessarily have to be if they would repent. You remember the story of Jonah. Most of all of us, I think, here probably know the story of Jonah. Jonah went to what? Nineveh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is Nineveh a godly city? No. no. Sydney in its day, uh, Nineveh is probably one of the uh, what we call Las Vegas Sin City. You know, that's uh, this is Las Vegas, if you will. Nineveh is Sin City. Okay? And Jonah was sent there to what? Because God always does what before he judges? To warn them. Jonah went there to warn them. And he got mad because he knew they would what? He, he, I knew it. And when he, he warned them, he told them what was going to happen. They repented. And God didn't judge them. And Jonah was what? Mad. Now, that ain't the way you, you know, church, that's not how we're supposed to do it. We're supposed to be happy, you know? Revival and people getting saved. And, but Jonah was mad because, listen, and we do it more than we tend to want to think. Nineveh is an enemy city, an enemy of who? Of Israel. People didn't want to go warn Nineveh. He wanted God to judge them. They deserved it. They deserved to be judged. He wanted God to. He didn't want to go say, repent, turn to the Lord, and He'll stir you. Because He's like, I knew God was doing it. I knew He would forgive them. But that is God. God would rather forgive than judge. Yes. God doesn't take delight in judging. He takes delight in forgiving. He wants to forgive. He would rather forgive. Listen. God is love. It's not that God loves. The Bible says God what? He is is love. love. Love just simply flows from God because that's God is love. He is gracious. He is merciful. He's patient. He's long-suffering and he's kind. All of those things are God. And if we're not careful, and I think sometimes in the church we do promote those attributes of God, and they should be promoted. But not to the degree that we forget too that God is what? Holy. Yes. He's righteous and He's just. And a holy, righteous, just God cannot wink at sin. Right. He cannot ignore sin. Yes. That's why Jesus came to die. The only way we could be forgiven was through a substitutionary death. Jesus died on Calvary for my sins, shed his blood, that I might be saved. Because God is holy, righteous, and just. He cannot just say, I'll forgive you. Or he wouldn't be what? He wouldn't be holy, righteous, and just. So we need to understand God is love. God is gracious. He's merciful, patient, long-suffering, and kind. But he is also holy, righteous, and just. And we cannot forget that. All right, that said, almost done. May, Amos' message is that God is holy, righteous, and judge. And if we will not repent and seek Him, then He will judge. Turn, if you will, this is my last verse, we'll stop on this. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Most of us, this is a verse most of us know, probably can quote. Most of us can probably quote this verse. We've said it so much. All right, but we need to understand here. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, for me, excuse me, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, we usually stop there. We don't usually associate the next verse with that. Look, if you will, though, at verse 11. He simply says this, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, 
we all will stand before God and give an account of the life that we live. If you're here today, you're born again, you're a Christian, you're a child of God, you will not stand at the judgment seat of Christ that he's talking about here to answer for your sin. Your sin was judged at Calvary. Okay? Jesus Christ died for your sins at Calvary. Your sin is eternally paid for. It's covered in the blood. You will, but you will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give an account. This isn't talking to the lost here in verse 10. It's talking to who? It's talking to Christians. Yes. Christian, you will stand in front of God one day and you will give an account of the things done in the body. We're not judged for our sin. But you will still give an account for the works, the life that you live. And it says the good things and the bad. But it's interesting here. Because we understand the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Listen. Now, it scares me to think I'm going to stand before God on that. You say, well, there's no fear in love and all that. I don't know. Maybe I know me. Uh, but listen, I know that I will have to stand in front of God one day and give an account. The biggest thing I got against it about being up here doing this, I really don't want to do it. That might surprise you. I, really, uh, I don't feel like I'm called to preach because I don't want to preach. And from what I understand, if you're called to preach, you want to preach, that's all you can do, that's all you can think of, then I'm, I'm not called to preach. But I do feel like right now God would have me fill in. Okay? So I'll fill in. Uh, but my biggest thing is I know I'm going to be held to a higher account because I'm standing up here today. I understand that. And that scares me. But listen, you're going to stand before God too. And you're yes. going to have to give an account for your yes. life. Now, you will not be judged for your sins. Okay? It's not going to judge. Your sins were covered in Christ. He died for your... But you will lose reward. You say, well, as long as I don't go to hell, that's all I care about. You will care. You think right now, well, as long as I don't go to hell, that's all that matters. Listen, when you stand before the Lord and you know all that you could have had, and all that, if you will, you threw away. Yes. For a bowl of pottage, if you will. He saw something's birthright for a bowl of pottage. Something that you couldn't put value on, he sold to his brother Jacob for, what? for nothing. Listen, we're throwing our rewards away for temporary worldly satisfactions. We're losing our rewards because we're not fearful of the fact that one day when I stand before God, listen, I'm going to suffer loss if I don't. Now, if I'm living for the Lord, I mean, seriously, and I'm trying, it, it, it's not as a fearful thing. Okay? But then again, too, I'm human enough to know that uh, none of us are perfect, and God doesn't expect us to be perfect, but He does. The point is simply this. You're going to stand before the Lord one day. Christian, even you will stand before the Lord in judgment. Now, thank God we're not standing at the great white throne judgment. There my sins will be judged. And the ultimate punishment there will be to be cast into the lake of fire. Christian, we won't have to face that, but still I will suffer loss yes. if I'm not seriously committing my life to living for the Lord. Amos is simply trying to say this. Listen, there was a judgment coming. Christian, is there a judgment coming for us? Yes. Yes. Now, in chapter 5, he says, what? Seek the Lord and what? Live. Listen, I don't need to be fearful of God. When I say I'm, I'm, it scares me, it does scare me to think I'm going to stand before God and have to give an account. But I'm not like, you know, like petrified. You know, it's not that kind of fear. You know, uh, but nevertheless, it, I take it seriously. I think it's a big deal. Listen, I can't be casual about it. You know, I need to take my Christian walk seriously. I'm going to give an account of the life that I've lived. All right, so that said, uh, well, we're going to stop there, Billy. Uh, I think we've kind of went through everything pretty good. Billy, if you'll come, we will uh, go ahead and.